for Type 40, a Doctor Who podcast from the Spacebook for the Fandom Podcast Network. I'm Dan Hadley, Birmingham's King of the Geeks, your regular host, patiently hovering over as much of the Hooniverse as possible, the past, the present, and the future, here on your free-speaking, big-thinking show, 15 incarnations of the Time Lord, 61 years and counting, whenever, wherever, and however you started your journey with the Doctor, we're on it. Eh, what's five months here and there, here at Type 40? So here we are, heading towards the middle of 2024 already. I think it's my Helmic regulator on the blink. We're about to be served the first full, full-ish new season of Doctor Who in over two and a half years. So what was New Who has now sort of become classic too, in its own way. A whole new generation of fans came to love the show, thanks to Russell T Davies' original relaunch of Doctor Who, all the way back in 2005. Now nearly two whole decades on, can he do it again? We're about to find out from May the 10th, May the 11th, depending on where you are, and there's just enough time for us to warm up by at last reviewing that most recent of specials from Christmas Day last year. Yes, there's not much in the way of seating in the new console room, but there's plenty of walkways and railings to sort of hang over and chat about all things Doctor Who with as I bring on my companions for this one. I've got Charlotte Shields and Kyle Wagner. Hello, everybody. What's up? Together again after all this time. Kyle, it's been so long since you've been on the show. Well, it's been it's been forever. I've been I've been I've been, I've been captured on tax planets. I've I, I've been put in seclusion. I, I I think I was like Peter Capaldi and just bashing a wall over and over and over again. Yeah, just keep punching, <laughs> Kyle. Just keep yeah, punching. Just keep punching. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a whole new TARDIS and and some new lighting as well. It's not quite so clinical as once it was. What do you think? I, I love it. I I, th- I think it's great. I love going back to the classic white look of look yeah. of the TARDIS and. And what you know, come on, it's got a jukebox in it. What, 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 what more does the TARDIS need? <laughs> I like the jukebox as well. What, what do you feel about that touch, Charlotte? Oh, I, I like it because I think Shooty needs to personalize it. I think every doctor we like it when we start to see little things that they've almost picked up from their travels or they just like, whether it's a chalkboard or a hat or a hat stand. So, yeah, I think Shooty needed to personalise, and my hope is throughout the series or throughout his run, you start to see it fill up a bit more with things he likes, just to sort of show his personality off. A bit of clutter wouldn't go amiss at all. Carl, what do you make of all this business of us rolling the rolling the chronometer back? We're, we're back at season one again. Do you think that was necessary? I, I think I think in a, it, it can work either way. It, uh, I saw this comment in your... On the Facebook page, and I, to me, it's they're treating it like they treat comic books nowadays. It's constantly a reset of no, at number one, like almost every <laughs> other year. It feels like, and that's kind of what this feels like. I mean, it's kind of a. Fr- it does. I, I think what it's eventually going to be is what you'll see this be like. It'll be whatever the current whatever it should be properly numeric, but it'll be also be considered season one of a new era. And I think that's how we've we've got to look mm. at it. I think 
honestly, I think it's not a bad, in some ways, it's not a bad decision to kind of think of it that way, because I think after what we just experienced with Doctor Who, with the last run, it, it indicates a fresh start. And I think they're not throwing out the can and they're not everybody who's panicking about that. He's not doing that. It's just, this is the start of a new era, much like when Christopher Eccleston showed up for the first time, it was a start exactly. of a new era. And a lot of people kind of considered it's a breaking point. It's, it's just like, okay, this is like the next chapter in the book of Dr. Who. And so you have everything that was classic who you have everything that was like, I don't know, I guess we can't call it if you want to call it new who at that time. And then whatever this is going to be defined as, which I think we haven't really we won't know for a while yet it feels funny to be on the other side of the 60th anniversary now doesn't it charlotte after after all that anticipation and all that countdown yeah and it was i think we had lots of hopes and sort of what we wanted for the 60th and from what i've seen in the fandom it's been very varied responses to that 60th some absolutely loved it some were disappointed, some were in the middle. It, Like I said, a really mixed response. I think the 60th was overall. So it would be really, I'm lo really looking forward to actually seeing now, now the new era started, what's he going to do with now he's, now he's not going over old ground, technically. He's doing yeah, brand new. Yeah, yeah. Let's see what he can do with brand new Doctor, a brand new companion. Because 2024, I suppose, was about reminding not just not just the British audience, but a world audience, and not just fans, but the general members of the public, why they love this show in the first place, Kyle. Because, you know, we've been flocking to it for, for decades now, one generation after another after another. It's had waves of successes in the States, hasn't it? The last one of which was probably with Matt Smith on, yeah. on Netflix I, I, like 10, I, 12 years ago. I would think it would definitely be Matt Smith. Capaldi had some popularity, but I think by the time we got to the end of Capaldi and into the Jody run the the boom of Dr. Who in the States was just done. And because it just wasn't registering. It's, it's interesting because I think this is another reason why they're also kind of trying to refer to this as kind of a new season one is with the aspect now of worldwide distribution through Disney plus Dr. Who's going to be on more screens than it ever has been before. Mm. And I think, you know, when you talk about the 60th too, I think part of the problem with it was, was that there was so much to kind of try and reset and get, or just get past that even with David Tennant and Russell writing the episodes there, there's just, there was just so much. And then I also, I also look at it as you look at how people view shows now and how um, split people are on ideas and how things should be that, you, you're not you're not going to please everybody all the time, and I, I think I think there's a lot of people who just need to just try to ride the show for what it is, for what it is, and what it can be, instead of trying to put their expectations on it of what they think it should be. Other people are writing it, and so if you don't like it, hey, it's not for you. If if you like it, great. But I th I think I think it I think we are becoming overly critical, and it's just not just in Doctor Who; it's with a lot of things. We're just becoming overly well, critical. Great of every everything and instead of just enjoying instead of just saying hey let me let me just enjoy this for what it is and if it's something you don't enjoy then hey move on to the next thing it's not like there's not plenty of stuff out there to check out we've all been to parties on on nights out charlotte just as carl says where we've sort of gone along because of peer pressure you know maybe you've had a hard day at work and you don't quite feel like it. you're not feeling it maybe you, you think you're coming down with something and you're not in the party mood but we sort of go any go anyway <laughs> and nine times out of, i mean sometimes you can sort of pull yourself around you can rally but most of the time you have a terrible time because you're not feeling it and i think it can be the same with entertainment can't it and if you're not feeling it then perhaps it's it's it is best to sort of to leave it to to step back a little i don't know yeah i think we probably don't are not even aware how much our own mood effects when we watch something and it's only afterwards we go well actually if I think back like I said I had a bit of a bad day at work or somebody had annoyed me and like those feelings sort of stick with you and then they they color how you watch something so I think yeah that that's a massive thing that we sort of need to think about what we're our, our headspace almost when we watch and just try not to let that affect what's on screen or I think more increasingly, try 
ignore sometimes what the production team are doing outside the show and what actors or writers are doing outside the show. Yeah. Because that, at the end of the day, is its own entity from what's on screen. They're being, they're being their characters on screen. They're not being, they're being somebody else. So that's another thing that I think increasingly is getting hard to do in today's culture. Across the board, I agree what Carl said, not just in Doctor Who at all. Obviously, the onus isn't just on us. We're only part of the equation, and we are kind of customers, particularly if you if you pay for the BBC or Disney+, Plus, if you pay your licence fee. You could say we're paying to be entertained, and therefore uh, they have to sort of play a part in changing our mood. If we flop down on the sofa, we hit the, the hoofa doofa, hit the remote, you know, and then they, they're supposed to transport us to maybe a better frame, to shift our frame of mind if we can, because we want to be entertained, we want to be switched on and taken away somewhere else. So I, I do think it's, it's not a black and white thing. I try to resist the idea that Doctor Who fans or any dedicated fan base are entitled but on the other hand, I, I do think that if you're not feeling it, we can watch whatever we want whenever we watch. Whereas obviously back in the old days, if Doctor Who was on at seven o'clock, you had to watch it at seven o'clock. It didn't matter whether you had a good day or a bad day. You know, so yeah, swings and roundabouts maybe. Yeah, I, I think that's fair, fair. And I think that's also having that ability to watch something at basically whenever we want to makes a change in how we perceive it too. The days of what we, what we call appointment television are done. Because yeah. we can watch it anytime we want want to now. And I think that does change our viewing habits and how we how we view things because it's not like, oh well, this is all I can watch in this time slot. It's the only time I can catch it. I can watch it anytime. Or uh, you know what? You you get into something else and then you realize, oh wait, I haven't watched this. It's been a, in a months gone by. And so your 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 viewing and your interpretation of it become a little different. It's the danger, Kyle, that the entertainment, the product becomes just that it becomes content it becomes product that's quite disposable and we take it for granted because there's so much of it well i, I think i think that's a big thing right now i think there is so much of it and i mean, i just look at it from my came just came out of a busy time at work and stuff i still haven't watched and caught up on and it's like it's almost overwhelming it's not just doctor who that is at a crossroads at the moment it's it's all of entertainment isn't it yeah I think. and the changing of the lights is is going on for an extended period of time isn't it well i, th I think you i think you, you just look at at least here i mean i can I, here with movies i think you're seeing finally the change of going from these big franchise films to something else because people are tired of being bogged down in a franchise oh i have to watch 13 movies to keep an understanding of what's going on with this, even yeah. though I might not be interested in that. You're seeing a lot more standalone movies or scaled down aspects of it. And I think, you know, we, you look at Doctor Who where it's such a, it's such a fran because of the, how it is as a franchise and how the character is, and there's such a big history of the character. I think it's, you know, we're at a point where we are at a good jumping on point for new fans with, with, this new era starting and i think that's another reason why they're talking like well this is a new season one just like it had been such a gap between classic who and new who what, when eccleson came on people were intrigued by it and i think that's that's one of the things that doctor who has kind of lost through all of this the last few years is the intrigue of doctor who and i think people are are, are more have been more wrapped up in the political aspect of what is being written on the screen than instead of the intrigue of Doctor Who and the idea of Doctor Who. And I think that's really, and I think that that's not true just for Doctor Who. I think it's true for a lot of things. It's that instead of going with the idea, we're going with how they politicize it and what, what political messages they're putting, putting into these shows instead of just taking the show for what it is and enjoying it. Shows like Doctor Who, Kyle, ideas like Doctor Who, concepts, however you want to describe it. They used, they used to be, uh, used to be described as antidotes to such things as you know, real world pressures and cynicism, Charlotte. They, these are the shows that would make you feel 10 years old again. So bogging them down with any kind of politics, whether it be party politics, identity politics, environmental issues, you know, really bogging them down with proper hard politics is, um, I think it's something that, that program makers do, do at their peril. Uh, this, it's already cost this show more than most the entire brand has been through a period like two or three years of retrieving itself 
from an almighty thud. It was very, very mm. loud and went very, very deep. And it's taken a long time to dig Doctor Who as an IP out from, from the soil and, and re-offer it to get appetite up for it again. But nevertheless, here we are. Yeah, I think the problem was the previous era. I think it, if there was just one bit that wasn't working, it probably would have just skated along, wouldn't have done amazing, but would have at least have a bit of that still, that interest, that diehardness with the fan base to watch it, with that sort of love and affection that the show has got. But because it had so many like parts that weren't working, it just was very easy for fans just to walk away. And at the end of the day, Russell and his team needs to entice. You're completely right. They need to put something out there that makes both the fans and the normal like viewing audience go, do you know what? I haven't watched Doctor Who in years, but I'm going to give it a try again. That's what this team really needs to work on. They really need to sort of put something out there that I think is very back to Doctor Who being that sort of antidote and Doctor Who being that sort of, it's the, what I love about Doctor Who is at its best, it's about imagination. It's about going out there and discovering the universe. It's about family. It's about connections. It's about all those things which are pretty universally understood. And I think we could all in some way connect to those themes. And when Doctor Who focuses back on those themes, it works really well. So that's what Russell and his team need to get, do, basically, I would argue, to get that sort of viewership. But more than that, like I said, I think they really need to get that affection and that love back for this brand. And it's not as if, it's not as if they need to reinvent the wheel, really. The appeal and the concept of Doctor Who at its purest form is enough. It's just taken a while for us to get back there. When we last saw the Doctor, he'd been literally torn up over the toy maker's diabolical scheme to drive humanity round every bend imaginable and make the world his his latest biggest toy some of us had a, a smash in time whilst others felt as divided as the doctor himself by the time the whole thing closed out but few could deny it did cleanse the palate and just in the nick of time but doing so is one thing stimulating the viewing, viewing audience to the point where they think you know what i'm completely down to watch a whole new batch of these i think that's slightly different as well kyle i think too yeah i think that's very true and i think there's still some issues here that are floating around and i think you guys can answer this question better than anybody because you know in the past at least here in the u.s the doctor who's always been seen oh it's a british show you know but we you know, we we've, we've embraced it for what it is. The fans that are here, we watch mm -hmm. it. Doctor Who, really. I'm, I'm going to even go back to the Matt Smith era. Once once the Tenet era really blew, blew up in the U.S. because it always felt like once you hit the Matt Smith era, they were writing it also for the American fans. They were writing it for mm -hmm. everybody. And then it kind of felt like when they went back to Capaldi, and from there there it was like kind of a shift where they weren't necessarily writing it for appeal to all the american fans and you can see that in the in the ratings in the u.s and now it feels like maybe we're on a shift back to where they're writing it for everybody and especially with disney plus involved now and the fact that technically we do have two doctors still active in the doctor who universe <laughs> we've got and i think that's it was a very intentional request by disney because they i know they have plans to do donna noble and the 10th doctor specials that's not been that hit it well hidden of a secret and so we're gonna have really yeah that's that, that in the states that's been that's been the talk they've been they've been talking about like at least three specials with three more specials with those two that is the so. first i've heard of it but obviously it would be ideal for the bbc if they want to fill up their universe app there as part of the iplayer wouldn't it charlotte to to branch out into other things in due course but it, it all does hinge hinge on doctor who itself and this all new era we're getting it sort of at the same time all over the world well, we are but we aren't we'll, we'll come to that in a little <laughs> in a little while too but we have i think it's easy to forget we have technically been served already the first portion of this all new era we haven't spoken about it up to now but this is where you're gonna get it that's right after 
I remind you, if you'd like to do some real-time travelling of your own, each and every edition of this show, past, present and future, is just a tap or two away on the device of your choice, but only if you know where to look. There's dozens of reviews, previews, interviews, geek outs and deep dives with all our regular panellists and lots more awesome guests. There's something for every fan over at type40.podbean.com. More boasting about that a little later on, as well as that point where we will make contact for a timely shuffle across the doorways between dimensions to the Fandom Podcast Network to hear about all the other shows there covering all our other geeky pop culture favourites too. Uh, but yeah, it's May as of time of recording. We're trying to recapture some of, the, some of the Christmas spirit here at Type 40 right now as we go right to the back of the, the proper start of the Shooty Gatwa era with the TARDIS back out into unknown spaces, times and adventures and a new Doctor at the controls. Doctor Who's return to Christmas Day had a lot to live up to and to make good on a golden opportunity to remind those families all over Britain and the world why they loved Doctor Who. Now we've lived with it a little, it's time to revisit this great reset of the greatest sci-fi and fantasy TV series of them all. So it's all been leading to this. The Doctor's back in his space and time capsule, spring in step, radiating charm, keeping secrets and helping out, hopefully, where he can. He just needs a new best friend at his side and a a monster to fight. So this was The Church on Ruby Road by Russell T. Davies, and that official synopsis simply said, Long ago, on Christmas Eve, a baby was abandoned in the snow. Today, Ruby Sunday meets the Doctor, stolen babies, goblins, and perhaps the secret of her birth. A modest pitch, isn't it, for this crucial episode of Doctor Who? I suppose the simplest and most important question of them all is whether we enjoyed it or not. By five to six in the evening, I think that a lot of the audience could be close to comatose, Charlotte. We've all had a big (laughs) Christmas dinner. So if we're not malleable enough, if we're not receptive enough to a new Doctor, a new companion and a whole new era for Doctor Who, then, then we probably never will be. It did premiere on traditional television, but did you did you watch it traditionally or did you watch it on the iPlayer afterwards? When did you see this? Well, I, I've got a little story because my parents obviously know I like Doctor Who. <laughs> It'd be hard for them not to know at this point. And my dad Christmas Day can be difficult, can't it? Christmas well, Day can yeah, be really difficult when you've got a this family. This is what was lovely about my my parents, actually, because I was ready to watch it like on the, on, on the iPad because that's what I've done previously because it's just I can watch it and like get, in, get stuck in that way. And we dad our tea, and they literally said to me, do you want to put Doctor Who on? We'll watch it together. And just, I just, and I'm not going to, that's probably a little bit of what, a bit of why I had so much fun, because I watched it in that setting again with my family, like on Christmas Day, have it, and also the episode yeah. really like capitalised on the fact it was Christmas again. So I think all those things, they just sort of connect with us as a British audience, I would argue more British than international at this point. But yeah, so I watched it on the day and I watched it with my parents and I'm not going to lie, I think that made it a little bit more enjoyable (laughs) just to hear their reactions as well and to hear them sort of laugh at bits and sort of afterwards say, oh, I really enjoyed that. I watched it with the family as well. Different generations of my family, so it's a packed house on Christmas Day, and whilst there were bits that I missed, Kyle, because people people were talking and or eating or doing other really unsociable things like like that, perfectly normal things, really. But the doc, as Doctor Who fans, we find interference. You know, so all that was going on. There was a fair bit I've missed, but I actually did find that this time it kind of worked because of the the bounciness maybe of the episode itself. How did you watch it? Uh I only had one option. I had I had Disney Plus. That was it. So, yeah. um, I ended up I I did I didn't get to watch till later that night. It was a good time. Um, I I it, it, I was it was it's actually a Doctor Who I was excited about, and I can't say the last time I was excited for an episode of Doctor Who because I even with the 60th specials there was anticipation, but I, I we kind of it was Tenet. I was it was more intrigued to what they were going, what he was going to do with Tenet. With this, there was a general excitement because we only had gotten such a small 
taste of Shooty as the doctor. And I, I'm going to be honest with you. I really like the energy he brought when he came, when he debuted on that final special for the 60th. It just, I like the energy he had as a doctor, doctor, there's something about it that felt like doctor energy. I, I and completely so I agree. Really... I, I, I was, I was ab absolutely hanging on his every word, captivated by him in the Christmas special. So I couldn't wait to see more. And, and of course, he, here he is leading the show for the very first time. It's uh, the church on Ruby Road, star shooting Gatwa as the Doctor with Millie Gibson as Ruby Sunday. And there's a small supporting cast here made up of Michelle Greenidge, who plays Carla Sunday. So uh, Michelle is an actress that Russell T. Davis originally worked with on the successful Channel 4 drama from a few years ago, It's a Sin. Angela Winter plays Cherry Sunday. That's Ruby's nan. And there's Anita Dobson, too, as Mrs. Flood, their next-door neighbour. EastEnders legend and Mrs. Brian May, too, Anita Dobson. Is she somebody that you're familiar with, Charlotte? Because Anita Dobson was a massive figure on television in the 1980s, but not really seen that much since. I knew her face because she has aged incredibly gracefully, I would say. She looks really, like, facially, except from obvious, the obvious age stuff. You wouldn't tell difference because I'd seen obviously pictures of her in her heyday in EastEnders but I hadn't watched her so I knew of her but I hadn't watched her properly in anything so I didn't have that sort of knowledge going in. It's written by Russell T Davis. He wrote all three of the 60th anniversary specials as well Carl. So it's his fourth hour-long special consecutively. So a lot of new Doctor Who content isn't it all at once but he had had quite a long period of time to to put it all together. So it, there'd only been a couple of weeks between the, the giggle airing and this premiering, but does it feel like a, a gradual regeneration of the show, or is there quite a clean break here, do you think? No, I actually think it's a, it's more of a gradual thing, and I think that's the way it actually should be. It shouldn't, it shouldn't necessarily be a clean break, because I think if you're going to clean break from the mess that was left, you leave a lot of questions. And I think he's he's slowly addressing those things and i think i think it's it works it's going to work better in the long run for that and i think too going bringing in tenant for even just a few episodes i think it was kind of like okay let's give the fans that comfortable place before we take them on the next ride let's get them let's get them give them that soft landing i think too because of how they've regenerated the doctor this time you have that time with that short period of time so we get a taste of what what's what it is to see if we're interested or not into going into the new era of doctor who with shooty as the doctor i think was a right decision and now we're to the point now where after this christmas special it is shooty's show it is it is it is him as the doctor and i think we're in one aspect and I'm, we're very lucky in the aspect we have somebody who seems to understand what it means to be the doctor in, in the aspect of how he carries himself as the doctor, the kind of kinetic energy he has. And unlike to me, unlike the air with Jody, he looks like he's genuinely having fun in the role. Even, even, and you can feel that even just with his brief appearance at the, at, with the final 60th special, there's just, you, this is somebody who is happy to be doctor who and is, live it and it is appreciative and putting his energy his own unique energy in it and i i think that as as him portraying doctor who that's a great thing he did seem thrilled didn't he and i suppose there must be a certain amount of confidence you can take the role with knowing that the words that are going to be on the page that you've got to that you're going to be reciting that you're going to be playing these moments are conceived by somebody who'd had a, a huge hit with the same show Back in 2005 to 2009, uh, Mark Tonderai is the director of this episode. Now, he comes from a background largely in American television. So he directed shows like Lucifer and Gotham, Kyle. So those are sort of proper big network shows, aren't they? Fantasy-based stuff. But he has directed movies as well. And it's not his first Doctor Who he either. He also directed The Ghost Monument and Rosa, believe it or not, back in 2018. So that was the block that were all filmed out in South Africa. Uh, Mark is a sometimes actor, a former DJ on BBC Radio. He, he was born in London but raised in, in Zimbabwe. 
the style of it doesn't feel quite like anything that we've seen before. Yeah, and you got to think with some of the shots he had to do in this, it took imagination to sort of pull them off because like the, this gob, the, uh, everything to do with the goblins, you think, well, that, sh that was all CG or mixture or it wouldn't have physically been there on the set. And you so we had to realise how big the ship was, how that would look view-wise, how the shots would show off it best. And they sort of have a lot of, even the action is quite vertical for a good chunk of this episode because they're in the ship. I hadn't thought of that. So that actually requires you to think and actually to think, but well, I can't just do a usual steady shot that just is panning. Like I have to actually have, almost have my eyes for the audience because you because if you lose that action, if you lose what's happening, I think this, this episode would have suffered actually, but he did a good job to my eyes to, to, to play with all those quite big elements that he had to sort of deal with. I was surprised, Charlotte, that this guy had directed on the show before. The name, it hadn't stuck in my memory. And to be honest, the Ghost Monument and Rosa hadn't either <laughs> in that in that respect. But here, I, I, I do think that he, he hit a nice, a happy medium between feeling traditionally Doctor Who and quite cosy and feeling as if we were watching sort of the next evolution of, of the show and something that that was actually befitting an international audience. Do you think that having that background in, in all those uh, all those genre shows on American network TV, Kyle, there's a good four or five of them that he's, that he's been on, would that have helped in, in that sense, in an international sense, and in the ways that Charlotte was talking about, uh, elements of the plot, for example? I, I think it does. I also think it just helps having Russell T. Davies there running the sh being the showrunner because he can back communicate can communicate with the director what he you know, can work work on that vision where when you were talking about Chibnall, he his vision I I will say this, I think especially the first season that Jody was Jody and Chibnall was beautifully shot. The cinematography in those was actually I thought very well done. But there's something different when you're filming a Doctor Who episode too. You've got to have a little something extra in there. And I think Chibnall had no idea what that was. You can understand somebody when they inherit an intellectual property like this or something with a lot of mythology and history behind it how they want to come in and make their mark or to push it on but sometimes babies can get thrown out with the bathwater can't they and you can change something so drastically that it doesn't look and feel the way that that show should look and feel and, and sort of wrap the audience up in a, a, almost kind of a sensory way and take them to the place that they need to go to to make them feel like they're watching Doctor Who. There's a certain there's a certain energy and a certain feeling. Here I do feel we've got a nice middle ground. Uh, Shooter Gatwa himself had been cast all the way back in 2022. My God, that is a long, a long time to be looking at this man's face and, and not actually see him act. They rolled him out on the red carpet at the BAFTA TV Awards. That was in early May of that year and he's, he's been doing the press circuit it seems ever since but the truth of the matter is they've just been filming multiple episodes but it, you do wonder whether now if he was watching this on christmas day whether he would do anything different you know he probably would because actors are notorious perfectionists aren't they <laughs> and we don't know when this was shot in his run this episode because they don't shoot in order of episodes going no. out so he could have already done two or three episodes when he filmed this we have no yeah, idea I, th I think it was the second or maybe even the third block yeah also uh, part of the cast of this quite curiously was davina mccall now she's a british tv presenter kyle a sort of personality really does a lot of entertainment shows game shows and things like that and here she's seen fronting a show that uh, the idea is that Ruby is trying to get in touch, ideally her biological mother and father, and to find out who she who she is and where she comes from. But I really felt that that element of the plot actually got in the way, not just of the rest of the story, but in of bringing the characters together. It felt to me like Davina's role in this was really really jammed in. It didn't feel very natural at all. Obviously, I, I bet you've no idea who Davina McCall is, have you, Carl? Uh, I, I, I actually, have, I'm familiar with her look, and I've seen her before on things, but I don't know the full story there. 
did it seem conspicuous to you that she was kept popping up in this in this episode? I think a little bit, but I also think that again, this is going back to Russell and what Russell does with Doctor Who. He's he's obviously establishing a story for Ruby. The Ruby mystery is going to be one of the things for this season, and so he's putting those he's already putting those pieces in place here. Yes, I can I can see your point where it feels like it's a little bit out out distracting, but I also think he was kind of using it as a joke because here's this person who keeps getting victimized by these goblins too, and like we're we're seeing just you know wrong place, wrong time for this person. I think I'd have found it funnier, Charlotte. I agree with you, Kyle, but I think I'd have found it a lot funnier had I not recognized Davina McCall if it had been a TV presenter, they'd have invented the way they invent the newsreader Trinity Wells. Yeah, I think we had another old trick here of Russell's, didn't we? Let's put a celeb, let's put a well-known face in the Christmas special, which he did before. I would, But I very much agree, I think he did it a lot more successfully before because those, like Kylie Minogue, she mm. wasn't Kylie Minogue, she was Astrid. And she was had a really well written character in that special. She was the companion because Terran didn't have you sort of companionless in that special. So I think if you're going to have such a well known face, you need to give them more to do. And Davina did feel like, well, she's known in Britain for doing long lost family, which would tie into what Ruby's backstory is, and the joke about the Christmas tree near the end. Like it was, no. it felt. I agree with you, very light. And if Russell was going to do a celeb, I think he should have given them a bit more to do in this actual story. And but then, I, and I think also, I, I know what you mean, because the sort of the goblin plot only really started to tie into Ruby near the end. And then Ruby stuff did feel, almost feel like it was its own sort of area, didn't it? And then we got to the goblins. There wasn't really a good connecting point set from no. accidents. And because Davina McCall is sort of integral to that and Davina isn't an actress, which I think she'd be the first person to admit, they couldn't give her anything meaty and, and actually have her play a proper part in the storyline, which I think would have been preferable. I, th I look at the Scream movies, Kyle, and the character of Gail Weathers, played by Courtney <laughs> Cox, you know, yeah. the newsreader character who's, who's, who's part of the story. I think that they should have gone down that road with Davina McCall, or not included her, or, or maybe bookended the episode with a, with appearances by her, rather than have her pop up here and there and continually break the spell for me. But it sounds like it wasn't actually a problem for you, so maybe it is just a me thing. Well, and again, this is coming from a U.S. perspective. She's not as famous here as she is over there. Yeah. So that 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 that's part of it. Um, I think the other th other aspect of it too is he probably did it as putting okay this this having this person be involved in this kind of adds a little bit more importance to this whole uh ruby wanting to find her biological parents issue you know, instead of just some other actress in that you you've got this person who's known for this and and maybe trying to add a sense of realism for some people obviously it didn't work for other people i don't think it really had an effect for, for me i was kind of indifferent about it i mean to me the one thing this episode was missing was david bowie but that's all <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I, I've just thought, you know, I think what could have been a better way to do what he wanted is what we're saying. Let's get this plot out there about her mum leaving her, not being able to find her. I think we could have had more with Ruby's family. Have some more of the, of, of the adoptive family in the flat. Have a bit more mm -hmm. of even her neighbours to sort of give you bits of that story, that the threats which he's setting up, because I think... It would have been more, it would have made more sense if they gave you bits about like oh we've it might have felt a bit in your face from the dialogue but just to have stuff of oh it's been so many years since you came to us things like that to sort of hint at what this is and feel more natural than having Davina McCall weirdly pop up like you said and then disappear and then pop up again. Because the plot to this, even though the long running story, which we're only getting the first chunk of here. 
connecting Ruby with her with her origins, with her lineage. That's something that they, they're going to keep going back to, we're assured. So even though they start with that, and a lot of people will, will relate to that and be touched by that, the rest of the plot of this actual episode is quite light, isn't it? There is a plot, but it's very, it's very linear, it's very bouncy, it's very snappy, there's lots of fun, and it's pure adventure. I mean, Carl, you alluded to it a moment ago. This is like an 80s family adventure movie that, you know, I watched them in the cinemas when they all came out. You know, Gremlins, a prime example, you know, the, the little creatures going going around, uh, messing things up and, and tripping over human beings and things like that. But it, it all looks like it's happening accidentally, but it's all been done by this little creature. So that's in there. And then you've got the whole uh, labyrinth kind of vibe that the thing's got. We haven't just got a Goblin King. I would argue that Labyrinth had the better Goblin King. We've yes. got a Goblin King in this. But we have that kind of public holiday feeling to it. It feels crowd-pleasing. It feels like something that people will will recognise what it's trying to tap into. Think, oh, I, I know this. Even if you've never seen Doctor Who before. And I think that that's another thing this episode is trying to reach. It's trying to get people who haven't seen this show before. I think even if you haven't seen Doctor Who before, you could probably, you can keep up with this story. You can kind of recognise the, uh, the, the tropes of the characters. There's, it's not a big cast. You can keep track of who, every, who everyone is. And you've got a little bit of mystery sort of woven through it as well. So, again, it's, nobody's reinventing the wheel with this. But if you're trying to win people back to Doctor Who on the biggest TV day of the year, I don't think this is a bad way to go about it at all. I think it's got something for everybody. Well, I think that's important because, again, you are trying to win people back to Doctor Who, but instead of it, this had that element of fun to it, and it had this element of nostalgia to it with the whole Goblin thing and what you could identify with. And I think that's... for especially when you're introducing a new doctor after what we we've, we've all went through with the last doctor, you needed to have that kind of fun episode to it. And then you add in again, Shooty's performance uh, and just the energy he has and the fact that he is having fun. I mean, even, even when they went into the musical number and you're like, what, <laughs> but it was still fun and it fit. And that, and that's the thing they they established something that I truly don't think we ever got with, Chibnall air was the fun aspect of Doctor Who. Mm. And they established this right out of the gate. And I think that was Russell's biggest point for this was let's put the get the fun back into Doctor Who and then go from there. There was yeah. fun and and joy, I feel. Charlotte, I'm allergic to <laughs> musical episodes of TV I shows. I sincerely am. And I was dreading this scene because they, they had trailered this. They told us there was this sort of song and dance number. I thought, oh, that's going to well, be they, really... They released a song, didn't they, before the episode? Yeah. It was even in yeah. contention in the charts in the UK. When it came to the point when we saw it on screen, I have to say I agree with you, Carl. It felt perfectly natural. They performed it beautifully and i even thought the song was quite well written and very funny and had that kind of it had a dark edge to it but doctor who has always had that kind of darker comedy uh, just on the corners i can remember what like i said i was watching it with my parents and literally one of them said and they just spoke about eating a baby like in a like you could just see the sort of disbelief but in yeah. sort of with a massive smile on their face because like you said it is ridiculous there's nothing serious at all about that moment. It's not the Doctor sort of being what we know at times of being that sort of brooding, dark, sort of giving a speech, like shove off. That's, we've seen the Doctor do that. We haven't seen a Doctor sing before. And I think for me, it did work. I, I With you, I was a bit nervous, even though I like my musicals. I like my Disney or Rich, like classics. I, I adore that stuff. But I think it worked for me because in the context of the scene, it actually made sense because what he was doing, he was distracting them. He'd seen them singing. He'd seen that obviously they, it, 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 it was a way to it's get them all of, looking. It's part of their, well also singing, it seems to be part of their culture. Yes, uh, yeah, because and that's that whole theme about ropes, how he'd learn, oh, it's not working on our logic, goblins, they work on their own logic, their own science. So that theme had already been established. 
and also you've just got the natural sort of expectation of you've got you've got goblins they're known as fantasy beasts they're known as sort of fairy tale creatures so singing is almost probably because of that disney connection now seen as yeah it goes with fairy tale and but it worked because when i watched it again yesterday it's very clear he he's doing it so he can see a way out and it's a we know the doctor does this he 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 sort of does that trick of I'm either going to make a noise or I'm going to do something so you're not mm. looking at one hand so that hand can sort of just do what I need to get out of the situation. And that's what Shooty was completely doing in that moment. So it worked for me in this episode very much. Some commentators really did take against the song being uh, the comedy of it being so black. Uh, they, they said it was distasteful and not the kind of not the kind of thing a family show should be joking about, Kyle. But for me, it's pure Brothers Grimm stuff. Again, I'm going to go back to Labyrinth. Come on, come on, people. Yeah, Lo loosen up a little bit. That that a lot of that was a lot of the, everything with the goblins was kind of based off of Gremlins and Labyrinth. And um, a Labyrinth was a PG movie by Jim Henson's company. Come on now, this is. This is the aspect of our times where everybody thinks that they everything has to fit in a box, any any square, and it has to it has to follow these particular guidelines. And no, this this he made the decision to do something that was fun. That yeah, okay, it was a little bit on the on dark McCabe side as far as just the content because you're talking about eating a baby. But come on, people, it's a fantasy show. Don't take it so seriously. If we have lost our ability to differentiate between fantasy and reality, and everything must be have this code of reality to it, just have some fun with something. If you can't, if you can't describe the difference between, between this is a fantasy show, this isn't real to somebody, and and not, you shouldn't be watching anyway. Relax, people. Relax. <laughs> yeah, and also I can't help but think if you think about British comedy, like if we think about the comedy greats, like Faulty Towers, Blackadder, that era, Monty Python in general, they were quite dark. Like they had that dark sense of humour. They had that sort of what they could almost get away with mentality in those and their beloved parts of British comedy culture. So I can't help but think Russell was tapping into that a bit with this song. <laughs> Go back to his initial run with Eccleston. The second, the second and, th and third episodes deal with aliens that have gas problems. <laughs> Come on, <laughs> this, is, this is Russell being Russell. Let's not forget, even Return of the Jedi had a song and dance number. If you want to look at it that way, yeah. Well, yeah. And, and it depends, especially on, depending on which edition you watched of Return of the Jedi. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I did wonder about this because obviously uh, Jabba's barge in return of the jedi kind of similar to the goblin king's floating ship in this you could say there's a band there on the ship that are entertaining him and his various underlings too i did feel that this was i don't think that was accidental either oh, russell took from several things for this episode but it worked and even though it was somewhat obvious it still worked and that that's the thing it's that's that's the difference between a good writer and a good showrunner and somebody who is in over their head. And Russell knows how to do the tricks. He's been around long enough. Yes, I know I'm pulling from something, but I can make this put my own spin on it too to make it not so obvious. Or even if it is obvious, you're you are understanding why I'm doing this. In by its very nature, you could say that it's partly a retread of Rose. We get a, a few similar moments in this. Some similar beats a hit, but this isn't Rose's London. I feel it's a very different London that we that we get served here. It's the kind of London I feel that's more in line with Richard Curtis movies like Notting Hill and Love Actually. It's a little romanticized, which slides into that fantasy feel again, which I more associate with with, with Stephen Moffat's Doctor Who, Charlotte, to tell you the truth, and the that sort of conceit that you were talking about, the idea of of luck 
being involved in this and look at the way coincidence and luck intermix and that people can be knitted into times that's pure fantasy and it is actually pure Stephen Moffat Russell T Davies only ever really toyed with fantasy ideas during his run fantasy has become more of a, of a mainstream a mainstream medium I think post Harry Potter post Game of Thrones it seems to be more widely enjoyed than it was when Russell was on the show before so again he's, he's spoken about this as something that he's doing deliberately starting from well starting from Wild Blue Yonder that second of the anniversary specials because that's where it comes from isn't it the idea that the the toy maker has been been let back into our dimension from where he was banished from and with him yeah. have come all these other other creatures we don't quite know who and where and how they're going to pop up but the, the idea is that the dynamic of the universe the nature of the universe may have been polluted in some way and that's could be where this comes in but again i see some people getting aerated about that or have been in the past like it's a perversion of, of the core idea of doctor who that doctor who is hard science fiction i would argue that doctor who doctor who is a fantasy show to me charlotte that tells science fiction stories sometimes it tells adventure stories science fiction are just kinds of stories that it sometimes tells and the show itself is a fantasy show do you see what i'm saying yeah, no, I, for me, I wouldn't say it's fantasy or sci-fi. I would say, for me, Doctor Who is almost like a selection box that you can have one week <laughs> your fantasy episode and then the next week you can have something that's very hard sci-fi. For me, while Blue Yonder felt like the most sci-fi out of the three specials because of the setting, because of what they were dealing with, with the monster and that. And then you can have something that's a bit more Earth-based for another episode, like Doctor Who is such a sort of adaptable when it comes to genre, I would say. It's not adaptable with everything, like some people try and make out, but I'd say it's adaptable with what type of stories on the week you can tell, because it is, there is an overarching plot with Doctor Who, but more, I'd say modern Doctor Who, obviously classic had longer stories and they were over more weeks. But even then, you tend to go from story to story, whatever format you're picking with Doctor Who. So you can do that. But I understand, I do think Russell does run the risk if every episode feels like this. I think it's going to get too samey, it's going to get boring, and it will turn off the people who do see the more sci-fi roots of this show. So I think he has to do the balance really carefully here. And, and I think he I, I think he's he's going to just from what I've seen of the trailers, too. There, there, there does appear to be a lot some sci-fi episodes coming yeah. your way where i get wary is looking and i agree with everything that you've said charlotte about fantasy but where i get wary of it is when it comes to ruby i feel that this is a, a decent clean break for the show and offering a modern young woman played by an exciting not exactly a new actress because millie gibson has been on coronation street for four or five years so kind of a household face if not name and when she was cast in the november i think of 2022 on children in need night you know, a lot of people recognized her and there was a lot of excitement around her joining the show so you've you've got that but i think the appeal of millie is that we all probably know girls young women who are very much like her but we've got this underlying mystery about ruby's origins whereas they they could be fantasy based they could be part of of some overarching story and i'm not sure the character necessarily needs that or that that would be helpful for the show at this point i feel like we've seen it several times with the girl who waited and the impossible girl and all that kind of thing i'm a little tired of that and i'd rather they just leave it to millie's own charm to bring this character bring this character forward i felt that after after all this wait like well over a year between when she was when she was revealed and when we saw her on screen i felt there was a real vibrancy to the way that millie plays this part very very relatable utterly charming at times i feel that she's a little bit in awe of this show that she still can't quite believe that she's got this job perhaps that'll ease itself out in time but 
I do feel that this is somebody that, again, you can't take your eyes off. You, you're hanging on every word that she says. And so she does feel like a, a strong co-lead for somebody like Shuti Gatwa, who, you know, whether you, whether you like him or not, whether you appreciate him in other roles or not, and whether you like how, what he says and, and how he behaves in public or not, Shuti Gatwa has a massive amount of charisma. And I believe that they probably have cast the right man at the right time in that role. And this dynamic could, with a, with a bit of time, actually be era-defining. The Doctor companion, sort of him wanting to explore the universe with a friend, is the core of so many brilliant Doctor and companion setups. Like, if you think about all the beloved ones. They often describe some of these pairings, Kyle, you know, throughout the decades. Some, when they come to a point in the series history where they, pa where they pair uh, the right Doctor with the right companion and they become um, almost inseparable, sort of the, the, the Doctor and Amy, the Doctor and Rose, the Doctor and Sarah Jane, they have a habit of labelling those companions as companions for the ages, you know, when the chemistry is just right and it's the right actors at the right time. Do you think it's something that, that can be sort of laid out, something like that, or must it happen almost accidentally? I, I think it, it truly has to kind of happen accidentally. And you, you feel it as within, from my experience watching Doctor Who, you know within like the first couple of episodes of a change, whether it's going to work or not. I, and I think that's, it's, it's one of those things to where it's, you don't know until you actually get them on screen and we get to see it. I want to say it right now. I think our new Doctor and the new companion that there's there's something there. These two seem to have there's an there's a chemistry there. There's an energy there with the two of them that I haven't felt in a doctor and companion maybe since Matt, maybe since Matt Smith. You have to have that playfulness. You have to have that fun because it takes off some of the heaviness of some of the storylines and uh, some of the things that they're trying to deal with. Part of the fun I think of episodes like this and times like this in the series history is that inevitability. You know we know that for the series to continue that these characters have to meet somehow. So we, the viewers, know they're going to end up travelling through time and space together, don't we, Charlotte? When the episode starts, we know that it's going to happen. We just need to see it play out how it's going to happen. And I think that's that inevitability that we know that something that they don't, that they're destined to travel in time and space together. That's part of the fun, isn't it, really? Yeah, because it's like... It's there's so many different ways you could do it as well. And for me, that's what I find so much fun about always an opening episode with a new Doctor and Companion. Because is it going to be like they meet quite quickly? Are they going to wait for a little bit in the episode to get them to meet up? Or is it going to be quite fantastical, like Amy meeting the 11th Doctor when she was a child, imaginary friend sort of vibe? Or is it going to be like Rose? How is it going to happen this time? How are they going to cross paths and how how and also I think you've got that as your first point you're looking forward to and then the ending point of the episode what's going to make the companion say yes I want to travel with you <laughs> yeah like that sort of what's going to be the motivation there what's going to be the hook for this companion to because at the end of the day I think we for, it's forgotten sometimes but it's a dangerous thing to travel with the doctor you could get killed so there has to be a real like want to do it and to make that feel natural i think is very hard writing wise to pull off there's this idea isn't it that we'd all say yes but not everybody <laughs> would no <laughs> that's, that's the thing the the... not everybody would at all kyle yeah no i mean it it's something to be said and it's it applies to a lot of shows but you don't know that chemistry until you see it in front of you and i, I think it depends on the actors i think it depends on luck there's just as much luck you can you can run two people together in readings and that's one thing but when you start getting on the screen and acting with each other and it's, it's a combination of the story how they portray the characters everything it's that bright magical mix and so you might think you have it going in and then you realize halfway through it's like oh this isn't working or oh we've got we've got mad magic here so it's 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 just one of those things it's like you just don't know until it starts. And I think especially with the doctor, when you're talking to the doctor and the companion, more than anything, you don't know until 
you really get started. I mean, yeah, nobody, I think nobody would have predicted Matt Smith having the, and Karen Gillan having the chemistry they had no. going in. And that was magic from minute one. Yeah. I think what it is, it's such on a human level, it has to work. Like you can write them as being the best friends in the universe. You can write them as look, getting on, but as humans, when we're watching on screen, we need to buy that and we need to buy it physically with the actors the way they are. It's sort of that thing of energy that gets said a lot about actors on screen. Do they have that energy with each other? And I agree with Carl. I think as a Doctor companion, this episode really sold me on these two as a pairing and actually made me go, no, I really want to see how these two develop now. In the past, um, showrunners have said, how they had, they've had a plan for a doctor and a companion, but that's completely changed as soon as they got the <laughs> actors on set. And they've had to basically tailor what they were going to do to what these two are bringing themselves. And I think you have to be aware of that. And if you try and work against it, that's when you get issues. I, I think I think it's an interesting point because I, I, I did get a lot of kind of Rose, uh, Eighth Doctor, or Chris Ruckelson, vibe between so the I. way because it's it wasn't there wasn't a romantic thing but there was like this intrigue thing between both of them there's something that intrigued there was an intrigue that they had for each other obviously you know uh, if, if we're going to talk reality too we know we know millie gibson's time is not going to be long on doctor Who. that's that's been reported a lot of different places so that might be also involving the storyline with the character we don't we don't know, but I think to have this kind of companion be the first companion out of the gate, especially for Shooty's doctor, who is a high energy doctor, is a good thing because there's a little bit of the rose feeling to it. There's also a little bit of Jenna Coleman's companion in the aspect of she's real quick to quib right back to the doctor and, and call the doctor on things. And that was something that Jenna Coleman was very good at. When you have a companion that still has this sense of wonderment of being with the doctor, but is also able to turn around and keep the doctor in check or, you know, match a little bit match wits with the doctor in, per se. It makes, it makes for a stronger connection of that companion and the doctor. And I also think it makes for a better doctor because you've got a doctor who's more on his toes with who, who he's, who the doctor is traveling with at the time. She was very much a grounding presence in a lot of the scenes with Shooty because Shooty is high energy. He's quite flamboyant in some of the way he's acting. He's, he's quite like sort of in your face. Like that's the sort of style in, in some scenes, not all the scenes, but that's mm. sometimes what he does. So I think you needed Millie to sort of have that grounding down to earth, sort of very, so, that presence to, to, to stop him. Almost a little bit. I agree. I think that's a good. I hope that's the dynamic. That's the dynamic they almost play with with these two. He's very flamboyant, but he's got quite a lot of. He's got quite a lot of swagger. We don't know how much time has passed between the end of the giggle and when we pick up the story with him. I don't think it can be too long, but I get the impression re-meeting the character again at this point. I agree with you, Kyle. I think it feels a lot like the Ninth Doctor. It feels like his personality. Is, is sort of settled that he knows who he is. The recognizable template of this hero. Well, I think I think for me, one of the biggest things that Shooty brought right out of the gate was the confidence as the doctor. The doctor has always had this innate confidence. And it goes back to what we just went through. You never felt like the doctor had this confidence during the Jody run. From the get-go, Shooty has had that doctor confidence to him a little bit of that ego a little bit of yeah i'm this but there's also something with with his performance i feel like it's almost a, a, like a childlike energy like he's looking we're, we're seeing a doctor looking at things for the in a way like for the first time or through different a different set of eyes that we've never seen a doctor look at things through and i think that's something to really bring forth shooty's performance as well you want to go on this trip with this doctor because of how he is, how he is and the energy he's being. And he's just like, this is going to be a damn good time hanging out with this doctor. It, there's a, a playfulness and a purity to this. 
which I, I don't think we've had since the 11th hour with Matt Smith. He's, he's not a copy of Matt in any way, but no. I, I can see some of what Matt brought in the regards of a doctor not caring what other people think as much about him. Because Matt's doctor was very like, he, he, he knew sometimes he looked a bit silly. He looked a bit childish. He looked like that sort of energy, but he, but he, but he carried on doing it because that's the way that doctor worked. And Shooty, I think, has got that sort of personality a little bit with he can walk around in like wearing a hat like that or he can walk or he can dance in a club and he he wants to do it and nobody will stop him almost. And and it was and I think it's interesting to see Russell t- take the doctor there because in the end of the giggle, you had that conversation between him and Tennant where he basically said, you've never stopped. You've never taken stock of what the damage and all the people you've lost. And it feels like Shooty is almost a response to that, his doctor, to sort of say the doctor at times. I think in that's New exactly Coon. what it is. Looking back on the 60th anniversary specials, that was the theme of them, the kind of the doctor to take the weight off in that way. Yeah, I, I think Shooty's doctor to me feels like sort of the acknowledgement that by the end of New Who, the Doctor had so much baggage and he'd done so many things and so many things had happened to him. And like there had to be a point where he just had to let that go because he wouldn't be able to function anymore. Healthily, he couldn't function anymore almost. So Shooty is that letting go, that baggage going, that sort of, I want to just enjoy myself a little bit again. I don't want to be seen as a saviour or a chosen one. All all the tropes the Doctor was starting to get. And I suppose for all that we as fans of this show, Charlotte, can sit here and say, oh, cross our arms and say, oh, that's not the Doctor. The Doctor wouldn't do that. The Doctor wouldn't say that. Do we really want this character to continue to go round and round in circles? You know, on one hand, yeah, we want that people to come to the show and recognise and fall in love with the show and the character that we did. But there has got to be some sort of some sort of progression, hasn't there? Yeah, it's like Russell did it with the Time War in two thousand and five. That was a massive mm. change for the Doctor, personality wise. It really informed a lot of those early New Who Doctors, the way they acted, the way they saw things. So, and I think, and I think I even said this on a podcast. Like, what's going to be the new sort of thing to sort of develop the doctors going forward because he can't use the time war again it's been done it's been sorted it's been put to bed almost at this point so what's going to be that new sort of push and motivation almost that the doctor has and under, like underneath everything i think we're getting a hint at it already i i think the i think the word is identity not so it's, literal shall we yeah. say i i think i think when that's a good word dan because i think what it's it's not it's finding a new identity for the doctor in a new era, and but when we're talking about identity is, and it's a it's a good point, and it's I think why they did this regeneration the way they did it because I honestly think that if I if I'm fan writing right now, somewhere down the line in this run with Shooty, it's going to be the regener the next regeneration is going to be regeneration of these two doctors coming back together and creating a new doctor based off of what shooting might have lost with the experiences of this by by regeneration that stayed with the tenant doctor the tenth and what the kind of clean slate he has as his doctor and combining those two as a way of like a full healing process of what the doctor went through through the time war and the period after that and then having this experience of being the doctor without having that weight, putting those two together to make a new doctor somewhere down the line. And I think, that, I think I, that's I, an interesting idea. And I think it's very Russell T Davis, but I, <laughs> I personally don't think that they're going there, but I can see again, it's all food for thought. It's all viable stuff. And it all, I suppose it all chimes with this idea. Obviously the idea of identity is kind of what's bringing him and Ruby. If it's not bringing them together, then it's certainly what's going to be bonding them. I think that's the impression that I get from what very little that we do know. But I do like the idea that he can sort of cut loose 
with Ruby and they, and they can have fun and he can see the universe sort of fresh through her eyes. She's delighted to see him dancing in a nightclub the way that he is. As you described there, Charlotte, completely free. Not all of the doctors have been blessed with natural rhythm in the past, if you remember. <laughs> no. The drunken <laughs> giraffe uh, was the dance move, the signature dance move of the 11th doctor. And that was hardly graceful, was it? Oh, Matt never did anything graceful. <laughs> <laughs> earlier doctors have uh, now and again gone clubbing as well well i say gone clubbing they've been in nightclubs the first doctor william hartnell turned up in a nightclub and uh, very very quickly i think made his excuses and left never even took the time to take his hat and coat off so i doubt if uh, the uh, the original doctor ever busted out the moves in the way the 15th doctor does but again times do change i do want this character to to move on and to evolve and to see him doing different things it was a bit of a culture shock for me i won't lie and the it looks like the singing and the dancing but no more than i felt it was seeing the 12th doctor ride into a castle on a tank playing an electric guitar with sunglasses on i didn't like that either kyle for me that was oh no the doctor wouldn't do that no 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 <laughs> so yeah i think that's the thing with the doctors each incarnation is going to have his own uniqueness to it. And I think in this case, what's what's really interesting is that we are getting a doctor with the idea of it being a fresh slate for the doctor. He's not carrying around that weight that the doctor's carried around since Eccleston of the time war, of all, of all of that. So now we're seeing a doctor who knows his history, but is free of that emotional baggage per se. It's, it's still there, but it's not, it's not, the weight that it was. You have a doctor now who's wanting to live, wanting to experience. Yes, he wants somebody along for the ride, but he, he, he it's very much kind of what you saw with Eccleston early on when he first gets with Rose and the enjoyment he's having after all of this heaviness of just having somebody to share it with. And I think having a little bit more of a lighthearted doctor, a high with high energy, and I don't want to say like we're seeing it through, a, seeing everything for the first time, but seeing it through a different perspective uh, that's a little bit unclouded by all the weight of the past is going to be, it's going to be a fun experience for the viewer. And I think it's a very fun experience for the actors as well. But what I find is fun for all we just talked about. And that, I think that's very much in there. I know it's near the end of the episode, but it does ring true to this. He does still have that doubt. He does still have that moment when everything's been resolved and he's about to go in to see Ruby and he stops and he says, am I the bad luck? So it's it, like he, for all those things he's, I think yeah, I agree, I like he's that. trying to explore. He still has sort of that idea of like a doubt and sort of well, second think, guessing himself, which I think actually works better because he's got in other breaths, he's so exuberant and sort of free and baggage sort of doesn't seem to affect him. Actually, when it comes to the core tenants, if we know about what the doctors is like with special companions, that's still there. So I, I can't help but think, and this is me sort of doing my fan speculation thing now, <laughs> is Shooty actually, is that doubt going to creep up on him? Is it going to sort of be something that we don't see all the time, but in certain moments it comes out? And maybe that's, I said before, the doctor has a mask. The doctor has a sort of a surface personality that is there so you don't look beyond. And is maybe Shooty's doctors that the surface personality is charming, smiling, exuberant. But if you, deep, if you dig deep, actually, is he a little bit doubtful? Which I think could be an interesting like, dynamic if Russell plays with that, we'll have to see. What did you make of the supporting cast for this? So Michelle Greenidge as Ruby's mum and Angela Winter as Ruby's nan. So we get two generations further of uh, the Sunday family. I was particularly taken with Cherry Sunday, the nan here. I think they were wonderful. I thought I thought it's the best family dynamic we've had since Donna's family. I I, I think. I think they brought they brought something fun. I love the interactions between the man and the doctor. I thought that so I thought they I. were I thought they were great. And the the thing of it was was that 
especially her mother, her adopted mother was such a strong written character and it reflected in that. And it, I think it shows some of what Ruby's personality is, but also how she handled the doctor herself. And I think, I think it was two strong characters that add to that extended doctor who family that Russell T Davies has always had in some aspect or another, whether it was Rose's mother, whether it was Donna's family, adding Jack Harkness, just it's something Russell does very well is adding to that extended Doctor Who family. And I think he's got a couple of very good characters here that could be very interesting in the stories to come when it involves Ruby. Because Carla's quite a subtle character, isn't she? We see somebody who seems to keep herself to herself in, in day-to-day life. She's fostered and adopted all these children, like 30-odd children. It seems to be almost her reason for living, but she does all this quite thanklessly out out of out of simple love so you've got you've got that character there and then you've got the nan uh, confined to her bed uh, drinking out of her pyrex mugs i mean to me this this is just like several members of my family that are, that are no longer with me so i found it incredibly endearing and when the doctor stops in her doorway much in the same way that the ninth doctor stopped in Jackie's doorway back in Rose, and they have an exchange. The exchange is very, very different, but the figure that the doc- the doctor cuts is actually quite similar. As you said, Kyle, he's very confident, but in this instance, he's, ver- he's very playful. He's slightly fir- flirtatious. He asks her, asks her name, doesn't he? She says, oh, it's uh, Cherry Sunday, and he says, a tasty treat, and flashes a big smile, and she gets all unnecessary about it. I just it was just lovely, lovely stuff. And it doesn't mean that the doctor is becoming human but the fact that he's a bit more at ease amongst humans and knows how to how to pitch that how to relate to them how to get them to um, to warm to him i don't think that's any bad thing it doesn't mean that he's any less alien i feel charlotte well i think you saw quite a few instances of shooty's doctor reading people in this story whether it was the policeman at the beginning when he saw the ring and told her about, oh, she'll say, so he told him she'll say yes. So that shows, once again, the Doctor knowing humans, knowing how we work, knowing our emotions. That was a Paul McGann. That was a Paul McGann moment, wasn't it? It (laughs) Yeah. And and he does the same with these two. I agree. I think the actual performances of the family were really good, considering we didn't have a lot of them, actually, in the grand scheme of things. And I think they needed to be for then Shooty to have them to play off when Ruby got taken. I think if we hadn't have connected or got sort of had any affection for those two, when he's running around panicking, trying to say, where's Ruby? It wouldn't have been as much of a reaction to them basically not knowing who she was. So I think Russell needed to do that. So the only criticism I have is before, like when we first see them, I think they're really good. I do find the mum's reaction when we find her when Ruby's been taken and she's basically miserable and like hasn't fostered anybody. I did find that a little bit knee jerk. Like, okay, you've not really explained well for so so, so much of a stark difference in the character to sort of say why is she acting this different. I think I'd blame Russell T Davis for that. I'm a fan of of Russell's work, his Doctor Who stuff and everything outside. But I I think this is the fault that I had with the episode itself. I think those scenes are a little clunky and I think they're underwritten. Yes, that's what I mean. Like The more I said before, have less of Davina, have more of these two. And then when you would have had that scene of her, like I said, being almost robotic and unfeeling Mm. and quite cold, you would have gone, oh, I sort of understand how... Ruby not being in her life affected her. But you don't have that because I agree. I think overall this episode, as much as we said it's fluffy, it's Christmas special, it's not got a lot of plot, in some instances it's almost got too much going on and it could have done with just a little bit of trimming, a little bit of sort of maybe another rewrite. I agree with you completely. I think when I when I look back on watching this on Christmas Day, I really, really enjoyed it because there's there is a lot to love about this. As I say, if you're if you're up for the romp, and that's what it is for the most part, it's a romp that's a bit like this and a bit like that. It's a reminder of of what we loved before, and it's setting up the future. So we've got that going on as well. I, I really enjoyed it at the, at the time on the day, 
when I come back to it after a few months, never not having watched it in between, this is only my second viewing, I was able to see see some of the cracks in it a little bit, Kyle. Yeah, I, I, I agree with what you're saying, but I also think I think of it as in the aspect of right now, at least for me, how I'm approaching it, I'm not looking for the cracks. I'm, I'm looking to see if I enjoy it after the initial watching if i enjoy it and then and i really thoroughly enjoyed this after the initial watching and i still enjoyed it after the second watching i see the points you guys have and i think it's i think it's a combination of we got to give him some time to develop the story and develop these characters more and not just one episode to expect to have everything yeah. laid out to us and i think that's something we're all guilty of especially i know i i, I speak especially for us viewership because we are still getting adjusted to the fact of these shor shorter seasons and these shorter time frames. that, you know, it used to be 22, 24 episodes a season here in the U S for a lot of things. And so they had plenty of time to hash things out. Now it's 10, eight to 10 episodes on a normal season. So it's a lot more condensed storytelling. And I think in this case too, even for Russell, he, he's working with a much shorter season than what he did back in the day with, with when he, when he first came around and, I think in the aspect of this too is we're trying to he's trying to keep everything you're trying to keep everything flowing and everything going and sometimes you don't want to you don't get the time to flesh out things more that you wanted to I I think in the case of like um, Ruby's adoptive mother it's the, the aspect of oh hey yes you can you can see that she didn't adopt Ruby and that sets her on a totally different path but yeah, you don't quite get the emotional weight of it because you didn't get the f enough time to get fully emotionally involved with the character because it's only the first time we've ever seen the character. So I, I think it's a catch. It's a catch 22. I think if they would have done something like that in three or four episodes where we've had more time to get Im emotionally involved in the character, it carries more weight. But when you're doing it the first time you're introducing a character, you're not necessarily emotionally tied to these characters yet. So yeah, it's it's hard to judge an emotion an emotional weight in how we think we should see it, and I think in our own heads, and it's something that we especially need to do with this new season of Doctor Who and this new Doctor is we have to give ourselves time to get a chance to get emotionally see if we can get emotionally involved in these characters, and so sometimes they're written so well that yeah, you grab gravitate towards them right after the first episode. Sometimes it takes a little time. In in this case, I think I think I have a little bit. I do have. I feel coming out of this. I definitely have an emotional investment in the new Doctor and in Ruby. I'm intrigued by the other characters. I'm intrigued by some things going on, and I could definitely see, depending on how they write this, what the how much more emotionally invested I can get. But that's that's the trick of the show, and we have to have a little patience as viewers to say it, it's not all going yeah. to happen like that. I I was less impressed with Shooty in this than I than I was in the Giggle. But then again, it was over a longer period of time. And I do feel it is, the, it is the start of something. I think he is showing some range already. He went from the, the, the light and bouncy stuff to the quasi-dramatic, because there wasn't any real drama in this. <laughs> the quasi-dramatic. He went through those steps with ease. And he was very heroic, Charlotte. So whilst I'm less enamoured than I'd like to be, I wasn't blown away. I do feel that I'm watching The Doctor. This is recognisably my childhood hero, enough for me here. And although I'm uncomfortable with the idea, for example, of we've seen The Doctor shed several tears already, I'm not sure I like that of The Doctor. I'm willing to go with it because there's enough that I do recognise in there and uh, there's more cool gadgets as well. I really like these fun gloves that the Doctor was wearing. You know, it's a bit of a MacGuffin, but there's not really that many of them in Doctor Who. We've got the sonic screwdriver and the psychic paper. It's nice to see that back as well. But I thought the gloves, they, they were fun. It's a fun idea that they can play with visually. And that's another thing that I've always liked about Russell T. Davies' Doctor Who, those kind of visual flourishes and the slightly cartoonish aspect to it. So I think that if you didn't like what Russell did before, you're probably not going to like it anymore now. If you did, I still don't think it's a given, but you probably stand a better chance. Yeah, I'm very much similar with you, with Shooty, at the moment. From what I've seen of the first episode, he's definitely made me go, I want to see more. And I think that's what, honestly, they needed to do. It, you can't... 
you, it's hard to do a knockout performance in your first episode. Sometimes that has happened in Doctor Who, but sometimes it doesn't. And I think that's like I said, it's such a high feat. So he didn't do a knockout first performance. I'll happily agree to that. But like I said, what I saw here, I saw flashes and moments like you that I was like, oh, that's quite good. Like, I like the way he's doing that delivery. For me, there was quite a few, like I said, when he was almost toning down his performance, I think it worked quite well. Like I said, when, when he was panicking about Ruby, I bought that panic. I bought that he was really like, I need to find her. But then in the next breath earlier, when he's running on the rooftop and sort of shouting mm. at her and sort of joking, I bought that. It's like that, that's the sort of heroicness you were talking about with the bit of the cheekiness that the doctor has. I think quite a few times he showed his intelligence, which is really nice to see in a doctor, whether that was the gloves or like when he was when he when her him and Ruby were captured. And I noticed this a lot with Shooty, the way he was acting, his eyes were always moving around the scene. Like when he was tied, sat, even though his body was still, you could see with his acting the eyes and every sort of non-verbal trigger was analysing that room, was trying to get a way out. And you need that for a doctor. You need to have to be able, without the dialogue, to tell me you're the smartest person in the room. And I think Shooty was showing signs of that already, which is good. I do agree with you. If he cries, like, nearly every episode, it's going to, I think, yeah, I think that's overkill, definitely. I think having tears now and again is a good thing for a doctor to show that sort of emotional side. But he also needs to be able to show when stuff does get to him, he can sort of be the brave face he can be the face that doesn't show it's getting to him because the companion might be the one upset or the people around him might be upset and he has to sort of be that constant, strong figure. I think that's exactly what the view public need. I think it's what this show needs and I think it's what pop culture needs generally. We're seeing a lot of commentary around this show, how it's time and it's appropriate uh, that this show have a queer lead for whatever reason or has a black lead the truth of the matter is i don't think either of those things particularly matter i think what doctor who really needs at this moment is actually a visibly overtly heroic lead somebody who is going to stand up stand up for the little guy to do the right thing and to take us all on the adventure with them there so i think everybody's come out of this episode generally pretty well i'd say yes you could say it's a, a small scale story considering it's the biggest tv day of the year and a crucial time for the show but i think what i appreciated about the original russell t davies run and stephen moffat's up to a point i think sometimes moffat could sort of i think he got bogged down with trying to outdo himself but what i liked about russell's stuff is the scale built very very gradually over a period of four years i think of okay if, if this is where they're starting heaven knows where it's going to end we're, we're getting some hints at that already some people have said that anita dobson may have stolen the show this episode with the uh, sort of mid end credits scene where she delivered this line direct to camera she broke the fourth wall on christmas day uh, that's been done on doctor who before as well by the way back in 65 but she did it in 2023 and and said never seen a tardis before kyle this has really traveled uh, where do you think this is going was she talking to us mrs flood or was she just speaking out loud to whoever would, would listen? What are your thoughts about this? Are you intrigued by this? Who do you think I, she is? Do you care or would you rather just find out when, when we're going to be told? <laughs> I think I'd rather, at this point, I, with this one, I think I'd rather be find out when Me we're going to be told. Because I, I think I think that's the fun of it. Is what what what's what was this a one-off thing, just having some fun? Is this is there something Could more be. to this? And I, I think we'll know by the end of the hour on May eleventh, because I think that if she pops up again, there's going to be, then, then we know that there's a bigger thing. If she doesn't pop up again, I think then we have to start going, okay, maybe that was just a one-off thing, having some fun. But, you know, it, it's it's one of those things, again, I come back to the way I'm approaching the season. I'm just going to let the story develop. I'm not going to try to sit there and, you know, put expectations That's on what, I, what directions I think the story needs to go or what's going to happen. 
I, I found it more interesting actually before this scene. And I find it funny that everybody's, I get why everybody's talking about this because it is breaking the fourth wall. It's very in your face. But I found it more interesting that at the beginning we see her, she's having a go at a bloke because she doesn't know what the TARDIS is. She thinks it's been parked there by yeah. this poor guy. And she, she doesn't know. It's very clear in her delivery, in the way the writing is. And then by the end, when Shooty goes in, she's looking at him with no surprise, with no sort of shock. No. at all that he's going into the TARDIS and she even like gives him a bit of advice so it's sort of and then when Ruby does it and she does the thing once again we talked at the beginning about what we expectations Ruby does the going in coming out running around sort of scene we all want the new companion to do and once again she's almost like this sage figure to her basically saying I, I know you're nervous but go for it so she seems to know off those scenes what a TARDIS is. She seems to have some sort of foreknowledge that we've not seen in the plot how she's got it. We've not seen in the episode because she disappeared for the good chunk because she was so like I said she was. Just... So something has happened in between those earlier scenes involving Mrs. Flood and the scenes at the very end of the episode. So there's a there's a good body of development of that character there that we haven't seen that we may see later on. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, to me, because like I said, I know sometimes the Who can be a bit loose with how people react to TARDISes, sort of not having that yeah. shock. But it was more, like I said, her dialogue that she was sort of like telling Ruby, yeah, it's, it's, it's okay, go for it. Like, to me, that's not the sort of dialogue you'd have from somebody who doesn't, have something going on there to be, like I said, that sort of guiding hand, which is what she ended up being by the end of the episode. It was very curious. I refused to tie myself myself up <laughs> in knots over this, the way I did River Song for about four years, Kyle. I'm just going to enjoy the ride. I'm a little more curious about this character. We haven't even got, well, we have got a name, but we, but we haven't. So uh, this actress has turned up twice in the show in the last three episodes. So we first saw her as Mrs. Meridue in Wild Blue Yonder. So that was the very first scene, the pre credit scene, who was uh, a servant of Sir Isaac Newton before he went out to the apple tree, which then got hit by the TARDIS. So she played that character, and we saw her play the heckler in the club where Ruby was playing with her band in this episode. So this can't be a coincidence. The actress's name is Susan Twist, and she's a veteran of such shows as uh, Coronation Street and Brookside all the way back on Channel 4, if you remember Brookside. She is due to turn up in the show later on too. So this isn't an accidental thing, or this isn't just an extra that turns up and you th they think that you're not going to spot it's the same actor or actress. This is going somewhere. So I am kind of intrigued by that, but I suspect we're going to get answers on that sooner rather than later. With her, it's even less we've got to go off. If Mrs. Flood's not got a lot for us to sort of sink our teeth into, this character's got even less. So I think it's sort of the healthiest thing to do is just to wait and see if what Russell's planning for this character. Mm. Uh, I, I think the healthiest thing to do uh, across the board is wait and see because I think <laughs> Russell's got tricks. Up, well, I just think Russell's got tricks up his sleeve that we've yet to see him use in Doctor Who and thinks he's learned in his time away from Doctor Who. And it's going to be interesting to see the differences between this run of Russell and the previous run. Oh, I can feel myself getting tied up in knots in a timey wimey, in a timey wimey way again, Charlotte. I don't think I'm ready for all of that. It, it's time for a short break now uh, to gather our thoughts and collect our scores too, which, as luck would have it, is exactly how long it'll take Kev to fill you in about all the other great shows and uh, engrossing conversations going on across the Fandom Podcast Network. Listen up, stay right where you are. We'll be back in a mo. Thank you for listening. We hope you're enjoying this podcast. Here are the other great shows on the Fandom Podcast Network. 
Culture Clash, where we discuss the latest in entertainment and pop culture. Blood of Kings, our show covering the entire Highlander universe. Couch Potato Theater, we celebrate our favorite movies. And Time Warp, our fandom flashback show discussing a year in movies and our favorite retro movie, TV, and pop culture topics. Good evening, discussing all things Alfred Hitchcock. Hair Metal Podcast, we cover the rock metal music of the 80s and early 90s. Type 40, a Doctor Who podcast, discussing the time-traveling Doctor Who universe. Lethal Mullet, an action film podcast, covering the 80s, 90s, and beyond. Also, check out the Lethal Mullet Network for more great podcasts. What a Piece of Junk, our Star Wars podcast. Making Treks, a Star Trek podcast, with a deep dive into the final frontier. The Fandom Show, our Fandom Podcast Network live YouTube show discussing the hottest topics in fandom. The True Believers MCU podcast, discussing the Marvel Cinematic and Television Universe. Union Federation, our Star Trek and the Orville show. And we're proud to welcome the BQN Network to the Fandom Podcast Network. Please visit our friends on the BQN Network, a Star Trek Universe podcast that also includes your favorite topics, movies, history, superheroes, and more. You can find the Fandom Podcast Network on YouTube. The Fandom Podcast Network is also on all major podcast platforms. Fandom Podcast Network audio master feed is on Podbean at fpnet.podbean.com. You can find the Fandom Podcast Network on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can email us at fandompodcastnetwork at gmail.com. Thank you so much for listening, and remember, respect others and enjoy your fandom. Okay, so now that's all covered, maybe we can cover you too with glorious merch for your person, your walls, or just your pocket. Uh, set your coordinates for tpublic.com, search for the Fandom Podcast Network and browse the store full of fun items bearing all the FPN logos, including Type 40, of course, seeing is believing, treat yourself, treat your other selves, and it all goes to support the Fandom Podcast Network into the bargain too, so everybody wins. Uh, Charlotte, Kyle, and I may have uh, slipped the little knots tied by those gobby, grabby goblins, but we're still here comparing notes on the 2023 Doctor Who Christmas special, The Church on Ruby Road. So it's officially the season premiere, Kyle, if you look on Disney Plus of all new Doctor Who season one. That's how they're billing it. So this is episode zero, and what's to come is episodes one through to eight. Yeah, uh, it's weird thinking of the Christmas special as the first episode of a new <laughs> season. I, I, I'm going to be honest with you. Usually, I always kind of I've seen the Christmas special as kind of like the re, kind of like the okay the break between seasons. So thinking of it as the yeah. first episode of the new season is, but you know what? It works. Um, it, it this episode worked for me. I'm, there's more to say about it. I mean, it's just it was fun. It, it, it worked, and I'm. I can't wait for the new season. I'm, I, I am generally more excited about this than I have been since probably Matt Smith took over the Doctor. That's the. I, I mean, Paul D. I was intrigued by Jodie Whittaker. I was like, okay, let's see what direction they're going with this. There's a. I have a genuine interest and excitement level to, to see what we're doing. I'm. I'm very keen. Kyle, I'll be honest with you, I haven't been counting the weeks or the months. I'm still not counting the days, but I did really enjoy this special on the day. There was lots about the episode on the rewatch that I either didn't notice the first time or had forgotten. So I do think it stands up to repeated viewings. And more importantly than that, Charlotte, this at long, long last really feels like Doctor Who. This is the first Doctor Who episode in years. It feels like it's not a chore to rewatch. That when I was like, oh, I'll rewatch it for the review, I could watch it very easily. I had a good time again watching it. And I think I understand why some bits of this did not work or some of the tone for people. But me for me, for me going in, all I really needed this episode to do was to give me the beginning of a new Doctor. Give me enough of this new doctor that I can go, okay, let's see what you give me in your series. So sort of that anticipation of what's what they're gonna do, writing and acting wise, both fronts. 
I wanted to see a Doctor and Companion dynamic started again. I wanted to see how they would interact. Would there be that chemistry? Would there be that sort of clicking of these two are going to be really good? And I think it did that really well. If people know me, I'm a massive Christmas person. I love the, the holidays. It had such a smile on my face when you heard Christmas songs. It feels like ages since we've had a Doctor Who, which actually <laughs> celebrated Christmas and knew it was at Christmas and fully embraced that. So I think that was lovely done. So, yeah, I, as a first like, introduction, it did what it needed to for me. I think it, it, it had the right sort of tone with the fantasy clear vibes we were doing with goblins being a villain and it started as well to do little threads which i think is good to see we said with mrs flood with ruby's family but the only real criticism i can say is i do think in bits of this there was too much going on plot wise i think russell almost bit off a bit more than he could chew for like a first episode of a new doctor and in hindsight, I would have had this a little bit more streamlined, a little bit more stripped down with some of the plots. So other bits that I feel needed to breathe could. But yeah, overall, I would definitely recommend this. I'd say it's a really positive and good starting point for a new era. I wonder if it's just him being undisciplined or if he's trying to serve up something for everyone, Kyle, in which case perhaps that is always a hiding to nothing. I, I think it's a little bit, there's honestly a little bit of both. I think they're trying, because of the worldwide distribution of Doctor Who this time, you are trying to serve up something for everyone. But I think that he's still trying to keep the the spirit of what Doctor Who is there. And so I think, I think unlike the last go around for Russell, where he was just, you know, the focus was get Doctor Who back on BBC and get it, get it going. And then it just happened to really catch with the international audience this time around, with Disney Plus being the distributor, you you are writing a different way because you're writing for a worldwide audience. And I don't even if you don't realize you're doing it, you you are because. And I think I think that's that's kind of the been the, the plan for Doctor Who is to get Doctor Who though back to this global sensation. And I think I think Russell's capable of doing it. He's proven he's capable of doing it. Um, We'll see what I mean. This is this is Shooty's biggest role to date, and yes, I've I've liked what he's done so far. We'll see we'll see if he can if he can nails it nail it down. But I think it's off to a solid start, and I think there's a lot there they can build on. And I, I yeah, it's going it, me it's, too. It's, it's it, it boils down to us as fans needing to realize that the doctors can like everything else is continuing to evolve and change, but it's also having somebody who can portray the doctor and having a writer who understands the doctor that even as the doctor evolves and changes, there's still a line there that is, that will always run through every doctor and making sure that line is stay traditional too, as well. So it, it, I think for doctor who to grow and get back to what it was internationally, it's, it's going to have to be something that's not only just off of the creative actors and creators, but it's us as fans and it's us as fans, me not being overly critical, not being, looking for every little thing that we disapprove of or approve of and just seeing, Hey, did when the episode was over, did I enjoy it? And that's, that's the bottom line to the success of Dr. Who or any show I going agree. forward. I and I completely. think we're especially for Dr. Who, Dr. Who we're to a point where it's time to stop overanalyzing it and just talk about, did we enjoy it or did we not enjoy it? What were the reasons for it? And move and go on. And if you're not enjoying it, then, Great, but let let's give it a chance before we even put it on the pedestal or throw it in the dumpster. Yeah, I I really really enjoyed this. Uh, when it comes to ratings, Kyle and, and Disney Plus, do they publish such things? Do they publish stats, figures? If not weekly, the way that Barb do in Britain, do they pu publish them three or four times a year per quarter, for example? You Usually where you're going to see it is if it's done, if something does big, they're going to announce it. But usually okay. where they, where you'll kind of get an idea about it is the quarterly stockholders meetings. 
Right. When they, that, that's when you get a better idea of the numbers of it. There's not going to be this weekly, oh, this is what it did on streaming thing. Uh, but trust me, if Doctor Who pulls in good numbers for Disney Plus, they're going to let you know. We're going to have to pick our way through lots of boardroom babble, Charlotte, to get to the stuff that Doctor Who fans just favor. For some reason, this is something that traditionally Doctor Who fans, they really, really hunger for this, for better or worse. We like to know how well the show is doing. So it's, it's one thing to keep track of it on BBC One. In the modern age on a streaming platform, it sounds like it's not going to be that simple. It's going to drive people nuts, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. And and they've made sure that now with the way it's been released in the UK as well. So I, I think we're going to have to another hard truth the fandom's got to sort of accept is the the ratings are going to be even harder than ever to sort of understand. They're going to be more complicated than ever. And a bit of the cynical bit of me thinks that's been done on purpose. Well, I think I think it's just the changing of everything going to streaming, and the streamers don't have to answer to the Nielsen ratings. They they know their numbers. Sometimes they'll publish them, sometimes they won't. And so I think that's going to be the, a frustrating thing for some fans. I mean, obviously you'll you'll be able to see pretty good the ratings of the initial broadcast, but for the rest of the world, it's you're not going to know unless Disney puts out those streaming numbers. The ratings for the Church on Ruby Road were published as we get them traditionally. So we have all figures now. Of course, we have all these months on. The overnight rating on BBC One was 4.73 million people watched it on Christmas Day. The consolidated rating, which gets published around 10 days later, I think. So that incorporates things such as iPlayer viewings, what they call time shift viewings. That came in at 7.49 million. That's a, that's a good increase on that original number. And the audience appreciation index figure comes in at 82. So that's quite an important figure that often gets overlooked. That's a measurement of simply how much the general public enjoyed the show. That should be the fundamental question that any of us ask ourselves when it comes to this stuff. Yeah, it's, it's whether we enjoy it. And I, I and unfortunately, I think we're in a world today where there's people who've already made pass, made judgments on this show before they even watched it. That's actually looking quite healthy. Whether this will be a precedent that's going to be set for the series, I think it's hard to say because Christmas Day is Christmas Day, Charlotte, and things do tend to go a little differently. But those are their figures. What about ours? How many uh, tasty treats, how many cherry sundaes out of five would you give the church on Ruby Road there, Charlotte? Uh, I've sort of gone between two in my head. I'm sort of going between 3.5 and 4. It's sort of which side do I want it to land on? Depends on how much Christmas spirit you've still got <laughs> left over from, from way back, like five months ago, doesn't it? Yeah. I'm going to go with four. No, because like I said, I think you need to remember this is a Christmas special, so it's not going to be a heavy plot thing. It's not going to be sort of as much sort of high stakes as the typical series is. So, yeah, for what this was, I'll give this a four. How about you, Kyle? How many cherry Sundays out of five do you give this? I, I, I agree with Char. I'm giving this a four. I, it wasn't a perfect episode of Doctor Who, but it did what it needed to do. It brought us a new Doctor. It brought us a new perspective. It was so much fun. I mean, and that's 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 why I put it out of four. But the episode was just so much fun. And you could tell that everybody was having fun in this episode. And it's just one of those... It was, it was one of those Doctor Who episodes that it's going to be one of those standalone you're gonna it's rewatchable you don't you know it doesn't feel like a chore to rewatch it and i think when it's all said and done but by the end of shooty's run it could be what still one of the most enjoyable episodes of doctor who he's done and i think i mean i think that's it's setting a, i think it set a good bar for where we're going forward so yeah a, a four for me across the board what little cracks you, with the cracks you can find in it to me are anything major and we'll see how some of those play out as the season goes along but for kicking off a new season and bringing us a new doctor, yeah, it's a four. It's hardly a deal breaker, is it? It's nothing that's going to break any spells. So I found myself in exactly the same situation as you, Charlotte, hovering between a 3.5 and a four. In the end, I have, I have opted for the four. There aren't many ways in which I think this could be improved for what it is. When it comes to the crunch, it was tremendously enjoyable. I did enjoy re-watching it. I do feel that the characters were well realised. I think that most of it, 
was judged really, really well. And if I enjoyed it this much, if I wasn't dreading going back to it, that represents an uptick from me. So I'm going with the four Cherry Sundays out of five as well. So that's a good score for this opening adventure for a brand new Doctor and a return to Christmas Day for Doctor Who itself, which I also did really enjoy. I mean, we hankered after that for quite a while. We I think did. most of us will never forgive Chris Chibnall for taking it away from Christmas Day in the first place. Russell T Davis, it was clearly a big bugbear for him because it was a condition for him coming back to the show. It's great to have Doctor Who back on Christmas Day. It's great to have recognisably any kind of Doctor Who back at all. You can pick up the church on Ruby Road on physical media already. It was released on DVD and Blu-ray on the 12th of February this year and uh, in book form too. So you can get a hardback edition of this at the church on Ruby Road by Esme Jacami Pearson. So that was published too on the 25th of January 2024. The Christmas single, the Goblin song that you mentioned earlier on, Charlotte, that's also still available. You can still download that. All proceeds go to Children in Need. Okay, so that's us up to date here on Type 40. The Double Bill Season 1 premiere of Doctor Who. That's all new Doctor Who from Bad Wolf Studios and BBC Studios. Begins Friday. Hmm begins Friday the 10th of May, dropping at the same moment but different times depending on where one is in the world. Episodes 1 and 2, Space Babies and The Devil's Chord, both by Russell T Davies. Those are coming as part of that double bill with the further six episodes due, as far as we know, weekly from then, premiering on Disney Plus internationally and the, uh, the BBC iPlayer in the UK. It's all still to play for, but every single one of them has to count. And here's a quick look at what's to come over those six weeks. Who are you? <laughs> Doctor. 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 Oh, this is new. Doctor. Doctor. Just, just a doctor. New trailers coming practically daily, Kyle. Is that standard issue for Disney Plus? Yeah, Disney Disney Plus is putting the full, is starting to put the full marketing behind this. I've seen the, the one of the biggest things that happens and sports wise in this country is the NFL draft, and they had several advertisements for Doctor Who during that, which was surprising. Really? So. But yeah, the full market, seen... the full mouse, the full mouse marketing team is in in high gear now. You did promise me that was going to happen. I was amazed to see a, a New York subway train wrapped in Doctor Who livery not that long ago. Really impressive. Well, that's the power of the mouse. I mean, <laughs> there's no other way to put it. We'll all feel the power of the mouse one way or the other, Charlotte. Are you used to seeing the Disney logo next to Doctor Who in the BBC yet? Uh, yeah, I'm used to seeing the, the the proper one with Disney on. I still think it looks a bit bad with the, just the plus. I don't like that. But the actual recognisable Disney, yeah, I'm used to it now. Again, it can be much of a muchness. And you could say that one Doctor Who image is much the same as another. We've got a Doctor, we've got a companion, we've got the TARDIS. But everything old is kind of new again. And that's really where we want to be. We want to feel like the brand has been refreshed and that the general public want, want more. Uh, that's the old girl starting up calling time on another Type 40. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be swinging the mallet and, and making another magically appear soon enough. So look out for that wherever you found this. It could have been over at the dedicated home feed for Type 40. That's at type40.podbean.com. Maybe we rolled up on the podcatcher of your choice, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Spotify, iHeartRadio, tune in all those places. We're also on YouTube, the world's largest streaming platform on the Type 40 channel with extended video editions of each and every show. There's exclusive extra Type 40s as well as our sister show. That weekly live stream magazine show, Type 40 Live, is completely raw, completely live, where anything can happen, anything can be said, and often is. So get all of that over at Type 40 on YouTube.
We're still on the fabulous Fandom Podcast Network's Master Feed, loaded up with so many treats for your ears. Never mind on the weekly, it's coming at you on the daily. So please consider a trip sideways in time for more quality shows from the FPN. Could be you'd like to have your say on all of this. Why not reach out to us through our social media, Instagram and X at Type 40 Doctor Who, or you can email us Type 40 Doctor Who at Outlook.com. There's always the Type 40 Facebook group to join the discussion, the never ending debates on the classic series and the new series. And it's all going to continue, isn't it, with the all new series. You can bet there'll be lots of fallout every week with each new episode of this make or break all new season of all new Doctor Who. So come and have your say. Charlotte, where can people hear more from you? They can hear more of me on the Type 40 Live Thursday shows where we have, like Dan said, plenty to talk about of late. And you'll catch me more on Type 40 podcasts when reviews start to come out of Shooty's first series. Oh, fabulous stuff. And how about you, Kyle? It's been such a long time since you've been on the show. So refresh their memories. Where can people hear and see more of you? Well, just tune into most anything on the Fandom Podcast Network. You'll find me there. Um, of course, that's at fpnet.podbean.com for the audio. And, if, of course, we have the Fandom Podcast Network YouTube channel, which you can find me doing videos on as well. Um, also, too, if you want to find me on social media, you can find me on X or Twitter or whatever you want to call it these days at akylew. You can also find me on Instagram and threads at akylefandom. Um, and you can also now find me on um discord at a kyle w as well so i am all i'm all over the place right now i'm just putting out shows left and right so check out some of the great stuff we have on the fan podcast network including episodes of type 40 uh the podcast versions and we've got some other fun stuff coming up we finally have some movies coming out to talk about here in the u in the u.s and some interesting tv shows as june is looking at a new star wars show the return of house of dragon and the season four of the boys and we will be definitely covering all those in june here on the fandom podcast network i can't wait for house of the dragon in particular and yeah well, i'll be i'll be making sure i'm downloading and streaming all the conversations that may happen in the wake of of all that stuff thanks for coming back on kyle i hope it's not too long until the next time mate oh no i i, I plan i plan to be back sooner than later because we're i'm, I'm all in on the shooty experience at this point that's the spirit and you can find me on instagram and x as the space book i'm wheezing and groaning ranting and raving out into the universe here about all things geeky inside and outside of the tardis so come and connect with me and yeah keep track of what i've got to think of it all as the episodes go forward this all new series of doctor who the only problem with watching christmas specials in may charlotte is that there are no mince pies in the shops <laughs> so i think what i'm going to do i'm going to jump in the tardis right now flip a few levers and switches and yeah go go and get some mince pie action what do you think <laughs> yeah it, it does feel a bit odd watching something with christmas trees and tinsel and it being like just on the cusp of summer <laughs> Yeah, I'm just going to say, Dan, if you can drop off a couple of those mince pies here in the States for me, I'd appreciate it. I'll do my level best. You're going to need something <laughs> to eat as well, aren't you, for that double bill of brand new episodes of Doctor Who coming in a matter of days. Uh, we always have the time. If you have the space here at Type 40, we'll see you on the other side. Take care. Bye-bye.